Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. To join our community, go to myworstinvestmentever.com and receive the following five free benefits. First, you get the risk reduction checklist I've created from the lessons I've learned from all my guests. Second, you get my weekly email to help you increase your investment return. Third, you get a 25% discount on all AE Stotts Academy courses. Fourth, you get access to our Facebook community to get to know our guests and fellow listeners. And finally, you get my curated list of the top 10 episodes. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from AE Stotts Academy. And I'm here with featured guests, Justin, Mark, Weeder. Justin, are you ready to rock? I'm ready to rock. Let's do it. Let me introduce you to the audience. Justin Mark Weeder is a psychology nerd turned sales coach. He's the creator of the Listen Method for closing sales and the founder of the Covert Closer, a sales coaching and consulting agency based in Denver, Colorado. Justin teaches his students how to collaborate with their prospects, ditching the high pressure sales terrorist techniques that are popular today. Justin, take a minute and fill any further tidbits about your life. Yeah, absolutely. So I live out here uh, in Denver with uh, my wife and two cats and my dog. Um, I started the Covert Closer because I felt like I had finally found a way to sell that didn't make me feel like I had to take a shower afterwards. Um, and that seems to be kind of a movement that's growing now, which is awesome. And I'm just, I'm excited to be here, man, and share this stuff with you. Mm. Well, you know, part of the reason why I reached out and want to get a person like you on the show is because I need to learn, and I think my audience needs to learn how to better bring our products and services out to the world, you know, and mm. we've got sales teams, uh, we are salespeople ourselves, we ha everybody ultimately is selling, you know, themselves in a sense. And I'm just curious for, let's say, the listeners out there that are interested in how they can up their sales game, um, just tell us the type of client that you serve, you know, and that kind of how that works. And then after that, I'll ask you, just give us some tips. But let's just talk about the typical kind of client that comes to you and what it looks like. Yeah, of course. So clients usually come to me, have a service-based business, and they notice their sales team is only closing about 20% of their opportunities which according to, to a lot of data across sales orgs, really actually from Salesforce, 20% is the number of deals that are gonna close just by you showing up and showing what you got and running into somebody that really needs it. Uh, so I help them train their team to close deals and double that conversion, sometimes triple it, uh, but without like bringing in some of those uh, Grant Cardone-ish sales bro techniques that people really can't latch onto anyway. It's amazing that those types of high pressure techniques like are still being used out there. It's mm. kind of curious. I mean, there's still a huge volume of people that say it's about the volume of calls and the, 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 the power and the energy and the, the demanding and commanding that you're bringing to the situation. Why do they even still exist? I wonder, do people like to get those calls? <laughs> well, <laughs> I feel like people don't like to get those calls, but um, I don't know how, how into psychology you are, but you know, if you've, if you've ever heard of the DISC uh, personality profile, you know, you have the dominant types, so about 25% of the population, those guys always find their way into sales, mm. right? And when it's natural, it works. When it's, when it's consistent with who someone really is, it works because that's just who they are. It's not a problem. Right. But you, know, you try to take someone who's not dominant uh, or is just lower on that scale and teach them those same techniques and it doesn't work. Interesting. And so you get no repeatable success. And I guess that for a dominant type, I, I am actually a high D type and a high I in the disc uh, uh, hmm. breakdown. But um, for the, what, what that just makes me think is that actually for most of us, we probably pitch the way we are yeah, rather than the way too. the customer would prefer us to pitch. And in fact, yeah. I teach a course on how to give great presentations and I, I ask my students right from the beginning to take a little test on whether you're left brain or right brain. Yeah, the reliability of these types of tests are questionable, but it gives you a little indication are you more logical left brain or 
as I call, romantic right brain. <laughs> and I then like that. once I do that, then I say, okay, so that, for me, I'm 86% logical left. That means if without thinking about it, all my presentations are going to be logical. So what I try to teach in the class is that you need to tell stories mm -hmm. because that appeals to more of the romantic right and brain, brain people in the audience. And so you can't mm -hmm. just pitch to people, um, you know, the way you are. You have to pitch the way they are. And maybe that's why a lot of people just go out and they just pitch, you know, their sales is all about the way they are, not necessarily the way the client is. Totally right. Totally right. I mean, empathy in general is lacking. And that's actually a big part of what I teach my students is something called the empathy equation, which is simple. It's three questions you ask and you can fully understand where someone's coming from. Uh, but if you don't know what those questions are, or you've never been taught that, which is the other, the other problem. Most people think that sales is an art that you should just be able to get on the phone and be persuasive. Right. Uh, but it's, it is an art, but it's also science. Like you were saying, mm. it's a mix, right? Yep. And if these folks are just kind of flying by the seat of their pants, some of them are going to be good and some of them aren't, and they're not going to understand why. And that's why you want to need a process, right? Like you step A through Z. You don't go from, you know, uh, just any alphabet letters that you want in whatever area you have to go order of operations. Mm -hmm. And if you approach sales like that, it becomes very repeatable. And then if something breaks, you can look at your equation and go, where did this break? And then you fix that, just that one piece. And then the whole thing runs a lot smoother. It reminds me of that, the book called the game. Mm -hmm. Did you ever hear of that book? The underground yeah, by, world of uh, Neil Strauss. Yeah. A secret. Yeah secret underground world of pickup artists. And what I realized, once you read that book, you realize these guys have the same pitch they're doing <laughs> to every single woman that they come to. And they're just perfecting that pitch yeah. and that process. They have literally, yeah. they, they're practicing that. And I was like, oh my God, how many times have I gone up to someone that I wanted to talk to, let's say a woman as an example, and I'm fumbling and stumbling about what I'm going to say. Or I'm trying to say something smart. These guys have already thought it all out, the whole process. And they're just executing that a hundred times. And I just like, so maybe that's <laughs> part of the key is having, you know, and when we started this podcast and you and I were talking before I turned on the recorder, you know, we were talking about how I have a structure. Maybe, maybe I'm actually good at structure and I should be doing more yeah. of that when it comes to the selling process. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, structure allows for freedom in my opinion mm. right because that's the only way you can truly iterate and know what works and what doesn't otherwise you're just flying by the your gut and mm -hmm. for some people that works right but those are kind of the savant level people that are at the top of the curve <laughs> not everybody can be there and they're trying to be something they can't be right um so when you add a structure into it then you know exactly where you're at all the time if you mm. need to flourish a little, you can. If you need yep. to be more strict, you can do that too. Absolutely. So what's, uh, what's the best way for people to reach you if they're interested in your method and learning more? Yeah. Uh, so I would say you hit me up on Facebook. I'm Justin Mark on Facebook. But you can also go to my website and you can get a free guide to the method. It walks you through creating your own response. Like, hey, what's your number one objection? And you write that down and then it walks you through each step to create that response like you were just talking about, right? Mm -hmm. If you have yeah. the whole thing mapped out, you, you can't go wrong because you know where you're at the whole time. Right. Um, you know, it makes me think of Napoleon, right? Napoleon was supposedly a great general. He was a great general, but the reason why is because he thought of every contingency. So he's never surprised, right? Love mm -hmm. him or hate him. I mean, he was never, he took over an entire empire. He was never surprised because he had already thought it out. Yeah. Okay. So I think we all got to go check out the website and also we'll have links in the show notes. So for any of you that want to learn more, just come to the show notes and click the links and you can go there. Well, that was a great introduction to what you do. And I think you've given us some good tips. So now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since no one ever goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it and then tell us your story. Yeah, of course. So this was a few years ago, I was working in finance and I was making the most money I'd ever made, right? Uh, maybe the year before that I had just broken six figures and now I was in the multiple six figures. And that kind of ramp up in money definitely changed my lifestyle a lot. 
uh, I had gotten a new car and I was getting promoted and it was just, I mean, life was good and we were making a ton of money. Uh, one day a coworker of mine goes, Hey, I just sold this house or I just bought this house, but I think I'm going to flip it. Like, do you want to buy a house? And I was like, no, I'm good. And actually blew him off. Right. Which was, thank God. Uh, that's not the story though. I tricked you. Um, mm. <laughs> but so I blew him off, but it got me thinking I'm like, man, what if I, I could buy a house? Right. Like I've always wanted it right now. The house we live in is like falling apart. We were renting it and we were also like subleasing it from my mom. Uh, which is, which was the landlord did not know about. And that made my girlfriend, my wife now, but girlfriend at the time made her really nervous. Cause she's like, what if something happens? Like, we're not, we're not tied to this house at all. And it was falling apart. And we always had to go through like my mom to get to the landlord because he didn't even know that we were living there and she had moved out. So anyways, we wanted to get out of that house. So we started looking at uh, houses and, you know, everybody's telling us, oh, the bidding is in, cause we live in Denver, right? And so if you didn't come with a lot of cash, mm. basically what our realtor told us was you don't come with a lot of cash, dude. Like you're just going to have to find a house and take what you get, uh, you know, cause it's like everybody's outbidding each other. And, and even if the houses aren't appraising, they're still outbidding because the, the inventory is so low. And so then we're, so me and my wife were like, well, maybe we shouldn't buy a house. Let's just, you know, let's just stack our cash and wait um, until one day we got the wonderful idea while we're out driving on a Sunday afternoon after eating brunch and we drive past a Richmond homes sign and it's like brand new homes from, you know, from the three hundreds or whatever. There's the inventory. Like, There's the inventory. Right. So like, okay, let's, let's pull in there. So we go, we pull in there and we looked at this house. And I think we, we signed the paperwork that day. Like we looked at the model and it was beautiful, man. Like we were like, this is incredible. And we just, we couldn't even believe it. And then we like optioned it out and it came up to, you know, just shy of half a million dollars. And we're like doing the math of like what the mortgage would look like. And it's like, okay, yeah, we can totally afford this. This is totally fine. Right. So we pulled the trigger like then and there, you know, guy one call close to us. <laughs> uh, but it was, it was awesome. It was a great experience. The sales guy was super professional. I'm very picky like that. Like I won't, I won't deal with, um, a salesperson who's not a professional. So anyways, yeah. the guy, so you, you were primed and ready there. though. You'd been thinking about it for a while yeah. so yep yeah that's right yeah and we'd already kind of tried and got told no and been at this roller coaster so we were stoked really excited like picked out the lot everything um and then they went through and and they built this house over the next nine months and it was awesome like we would show up we probably were going to the build like once or twice a week and then towards the end it was like three or four times a week pretty much every day we just you want to go see the house it was only like 20 minutes away from where we live <laughs> So like we're walking in there. So like it's like a picnic the out in the front yeah. with the, where all the garbage is and they're throwing away all this stuff and you're having like a picnic lunch with some tea and yeah. Okay. Dude, <laughs> like no joke. You literally described, we went and got some food one day after they poured our back patio and we went and got some food from like a, a Wendy's or something. And went out there and just sat there and ate it, just talking about the backyard. And, we and watch the food. cement dry. Yeah. Watch the cement dry was the most interesting thing in the world to us. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I mean, and then everything went off without the hitch. Like the house was built. Uh, we got the mortgage, we signed for it, we moved in. And at the time we had just spent the last like six or seven months not buying anything for ourselves because we didn't want to uh, waste any money. We wanted to pay down debt before we moved into mm -hmm. the house, right? And so we actually got all of our debt paid off before we moved in. It was one of the conditions of our mortgage. Um, and, but what we did is we went and spent, we opened a bunch of credit cards and spent a bunch of money filling this 4,000 square foot house with all the stuff we didn't have, like furniture and dishes and light fixtures and getting a, you know, $25,000 landscape job in the backyard and all, you know, basically all the associated costs. Right. Mm. And we thought it was great. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and it was great. It was great for the first six months. Um, and, and, and don't get me wrong, the house is beautiful. And, and it was just, I just felt this creeping suspicion that something was wrong and I couldn't get over. It. it was like, I was walking around. I felt like a zombie, you know, like I just had this massive anxiety. And then around that time I started my business. Right. And 
I started going through and learning all these things from gurus, right? Mm. And gurus and their programs also teach you about money, right? And they go, credit card debt's very bad. Doesn't matter if it's on 0% or not. It's very bad. And I'm starting to see all these things I didn't pay off because the other thing that happened was they changed my job. So I had, I had risen to a uh, director level position at this company. And uh, six months after we moved into our house, they came to us and said, hey, we're going to change your pay, which is within their right. I'm not even right. mad at them. That's within their right. But I looked at the pay plan and I said, this is not going to work for me. I mean, if you make these adjustments, it'll work for me. And they just couldn't do it. You know, that business is business, right? So I had to step down uh, from that management position and be back on the phone. And it took me a couple months to get ramped up. And so during this time, I'm starting to see these credit cards, no interest exp uh, time expiring and they haven't been paid off. And, and I'm learning about money too, because now I, I grew up really, I grew up poor. Like my mom was mm. single mom, God bless her. She raised me, did a good job, I think, hopefully. And, you know, but she didn't know anything about money either. She never had a credit card until I was already out of the house. Right. And then in school, they don't teach you that stuff. So I just, I just didn't, I didn't know. I figured, well, they're giving me the credit. I can afford it. It's fine. I'll pay it off. You know, like I'm making what 20, adults do. grand a month. Right. It's what adults do. America's founded on debt. Right. But mm. I just didn't know how it all worked. <laughs> but like America's debt is obviously different than personal mm. debt. I just didn't know that. And so I just, and I justified it to myself. And so as I start learning, it's like this weight just starts like just crushing down on me, man. And I start thinking all the time. And like, I look around at our habits and I'm like, dude, we're just using the same room. We have a four bedroom house and no kids. And we don't plan on having kids for a while. And why do we have this four bedroom house, dude, with like a full backyard and two spaces and two home theaters and a basement that's unfinished. And like, and then that, <laughs> that summer, after I started realizing all that stuff, our sprinkler system had to be fixed. And that was like, you know, a, a major expense. I don't even remember how much, but I was really upset about that because it was right outside of warranty. And I'm just looking around and I'm learning about it going, man, if, if I lose my job for sure, for sure, or something happens, like we are screwed. Mm. You, and, and we have this $3,000 mortgage. Like, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? We could be investing this money. We should have stayed where we were paying 900 bucks before. We should have yep. just got over it. Right. And it was so scary. And I was just depressed all the time. So that affected work that affected me trying to start this business. And it affected my relationship too. I mean, my wife was like, what's wrong with you? And I was just like, I'm mm. just stressed out, you know? And then when you're stressed, the spending you think makes you feel better. So yeah. you just keep buying more stuff. And mm. that's what I did. I just kept buying more stuff. And, you know, like I, I bought, I'm, I'm not, I don't regret it, but I bought thousands of dollars worth of books, you know, and I bought for more then you need bookshelves. Then you need bookshelves. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, I bought uh, um, recording equipment for my business, you know, mm -hmm. coaching programs. I just was spending, 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 spending. And it, I just kept the whole, kept getting bigger. The more I spent the whole bigger, the whole got. And it was just like, what is happening here? I was just, I was really depressed, honestly. And what was the bottom? Like, what was the moment where you kind of realized you were at the yeah. bottom? <laughs> so um we ended up and i'm gonna fa i'll fast forward because that's a whole other story but we ended up selling the house and moving to minnesota to kind of chase an opportunity uh to work at a startup um that ended up not working out very well we moved back and it wasn't until we moved back that we were sitting there looking at our finances and we really pulled everything together and looked at the numbers and we were like this has got to stop you know that like we, we can't keep doing this we're we are we're never going to get out, you know, and we need to make the lifestyle changes today, right now. And uh, it was a tough conversation because both of us, we got emotional and we wanted to blame the other person. And it's like, mm, sure. that's not going to help us get through this. Right. We want someone to blame. Um, and so, but in, in our the typical leader family fashion, we banded together, we figured it out and uh, you know, we're, we're moving in the positive direction. I'll say. Mm, mm, mm. So tell me what lessons did you learn from this experience? Yeah, well, I learned that you should use debt to buy assets, <laughs> mm. not, not to buy shiny stuff. Uh, and uh, on a deeper level, I, I learned that you can't ever be happy with something else. You got to be happy with yourself. The only happiness you can ever experience comes from inside you. 
A car mm. might make you temporarily excited, but it's not going to make you happy. You know, a fast computer might make you more efficient at work, but it's not going to make you happy. That happiness has got to come inside. And when you have that feeling, then you don't have anything to lose. And then all of a sudden, everything becomes easy. Yeah. Wow. Um, so maybe I'll, I wrote down some things as you were talking that I, uh, maybe I'll share kind of what I was thinking about it. You know, one mm -hmm. of the things about debt and um, as an, as a financial analyst looking at companies, I would say the number one risk factor that any company faces is debt mm -hmm. because with debt, a bank can force you into bankruptcy basically. And if you were to run your business with no debt, you're not going to have as much money to grow your business, but nobody can force you. And a good example right now is my, one of my businesses with my best friend Dale here in Thailand is a factory, a coffee factory, and we've existed for 25 years. And generally, we don't have much debt. We're completely mm -hmm. financed by ourselves. So the end result of that is that when the crisis came, we immediately reviewed our debt and tried to pay back everything we could that wouldn't, you know, that would cause us a trouble. And then yeah. that way, we can go through a lot of difficulty. We can go through negative cash flow periods of time. But the point is nobody can shut us down. Yeah, that, it that is the freedom of debt. But also I can see after analyzing thousands of companies over 30 years, it's the number one risk that causes a company to have to go through emergency. There's some other risks like, you know, the concentration of your customers. There's other risks like foreign exchange risk and stuff. But debt to me is number one. Number second thing is that I thought about is the idea of keeping costs low. And, you know, I just love the word frugal. It's such a great yeah. word. And frugal basically meaning, you know, to be very, very careful about your spending. And I, the way I approached that concept when I was young is that my goal was to live deeply below my income live at a level that is deeply below my income. Now, yeah. the best way to do that is increase your income, by the way. The hardest way to do that Love is that. But the hardest way to do that is just cut your costs. Yeah. So I did both and you know, but I can say the funner way, the more fun way is to make more money and just keep your costs where they are. And I can remember here in Thailand a friend of mine worked for the Ministry of Finance and he and I were good friends for years and but he's like, man, you got to stop walking around Bangkok with a backpack and driving a Toyota. And you don't have what? any watches on and you don't have anything, you know, you got to you got to live up to your class, man. And I was like, no, nah, I'm OK with it as it is. You know, I think I'm I ha I'm happy with how my bank account looks, you know. Yeah. So yeah. I just the second thing. So the first thing is debt is just the most dangerous thing. The second thing is keeping your costs really low. I have a course called How to Start Building Your Wealth, Investing in the Stock Market. And in this podcast, I also talk about create, grow, and protect wealth. And basically, there's kind of two main ways that we can create wealth. The one is that we have our own business. Mm -hmm. And when you're a business owner, hopefully your company is making profit and that's generating wealth for you and your family and your other shareholders. Mm -hmm. But the other way that you can create wealth is if you were making $100,000 a year in a job and you were able to Let's just say you spent 90000 Okay, you're creating wealth of 10000 in that month. But if you could get that 90000 down to, let's say, 60000 now you're generating, you are creating wealth of that, you know, 40000 So the point mm. is, is that, you know... Oh, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah, so there are... I used to only talk about the one way, which was to do business. But come on, that majority of people aren't going to do that. So... Take pride in living deeply below your means and you will be creating wealth every single month. And I think that that also, I learned a lesson from a great book called um, The Six Month Fix and it was about how to turn around a business. And he said, the only thing you can control right now are your costs. That's true. Yep. You, know, you can have a dream about the products yeah. you're going to get out and they're going to do all that and the customers you're going to get, but that's, you don't have control of that right now. Yeah. So. And then the third thing I just thought I'd mention is just, you know, you, you said something like in, you said, get, you know, go into debt to buy assets. And I just thought I would just explain, you know, what is an asset? An asset is, is something that you purchase that you expect to bring you future economic benefit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, it may be an asset that can make you more productive. 
So that asset's not necessarily bringing you cash, but it's helping you generate more cash, and therefore it brings you economic benefit. Or it could be an asset could be buying a house that you rent out, as an example, and that asset is bringing you cash every month from the rent that someone's paying. But I think it's an important distinction to distinguish what is an asset versus an expense. Expense mm -hmm. is all the different stuff that we buy for consumption purposes. And okay. that's, that's like that bookshelf that we talked about, you know, that you may have to buy because you bought all the books. In a sense, it's an asset, but it's not really going to bring you additional not much value. income. Yeah. It, it may fall in value, you know, pretty quickly. So I think the, the, the importance of understanding the, 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 the debt, the thing about living deeply below your means, and then the idea of what is an asset. Anything you would add to that? Uh, no, I think if you nailed it. I mean, definitely way more succinctly than I could have for sure. But you're absolutely right. You know, debt is just, it's, it's so scary. And once you realize what it really means, it's, <laughs> you yeah. know. Yeah. Well, you know, you're not alone. There's millions of people in America and around the world that have been accumulating debt, particularly during this time where, mm -hmm. you know, it's such a difficult time. So let me, let me put that, this in context. Then the next question I'm going to ask you, I want to think about that young man or woman who was either starting to get themselves into debt, starting to overextend themselves, or already kind of in it a bit. So based upon what you learned from this story and what you continue to learn, what one action would you recommend our listeners take to avoid suffering the same fate? Yeah, I would say get educated on how money works and, and uh, do your best to understand uh, compound interest. <laughs> mm, great advice. And I, one thing about compound interest that most people do not understand, but since I'm a finance guy, I understand. We see yeah. the concept of, finance, of compound interest is basically if you, uh, if, you, if you, let's just say you put money into the bank, uh, $100 or whatever, it's going to earn interest and that interest is going to earn interest and that's going to compound over time. And then it will have an exponential rise in year 30 or year 40, year 50. So the first element we have to know about compound interest is that the impact of it, the substantial impact of it doesn't happen until year 20 or 30. Mm. That's the first thing about compound interest that most people don't realize. You have to keep yeah. the money. The second thing that most people don't realize and they think about, oh, I'm going to have passive income because as I build up my money, I'm going to, you know, it's going to be, I'm going to be receiving money every month from my, from my wealth, right? No, 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 no. That's actually not the case. The assumption uh, when you calculate compound interest, you are assuming that every single bit of cash flow and gain that you receive is reinvested. Yeah. You can never take anything out of it or you will end up with a linear rather than exponential line. And that's the second thing that a lot of people don't realize is that, so, so two things. Number one, you've got to keep it in for a long time. And the second thing is every single bit of income that comes from it, you cannot take it out and have do a vacation getaway or whatever, you've just destroyed the compounding element. It's, it's so true because it takes that time. And, you know, God, even if it's just a little bit of money, it still helps. Like, you just can't. What we started doing, uh, can I share one more thing? Yeah, yeah. What we started doing in, in this household is we calculate the compound interest of what's something that we want to buy. So we say, what's the real cost of this, right? If it's a you know five hundred dollar PlayStation, okay, cool, five hundred dollars compounded over thirty years, it's more like twenty grand or something. No, I'm not going to buy a twenty thousand dollar PlayStation. I'll put the five hundred dollars in my account. <laughs> mm. Yep, yep, that's a great way to do it. Well, last question: What's your number one goal for the next twelve months? Yeah, my number one goal is actually to get completely out of credit card debt. So we will, in the next twelve months, no matter what, we will have zero revolving debt. Mm. Fantastic! That's exciting. Um, I, by the way, your advice, I just thought that actually you just gave a second piece of very good advice, and that is to calculate the compound value, compounded value of something that you want to buy. And um, for the listeners out there, you can do that in Excel as an example. You can do that on a calculator. You just say, you know, one plus whatever interest rate it is raised to the number of years and then you multiply that times the value. And then that is such a great and powerful tool. So I think that I want to make sure we get that as the second piece of advice that you gave. Well, for sure. I totally broke your rule. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's a good one though. I, that's, that's valuable. All right, listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. My number one goal 
for the next 12 months is to help you, my listener, reduce risk and increase return in your life. To achieve this, I've created our community at myworstinvestmentever.com, and I look forward to seeing you there. As we conclude, Justin, I want to thank you again for coming on the show. And on behalf of A. Stotts Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? Uh, I would just say, you know, thank you very much for listening and keep an eye on that spending and don't do credit cards. <laughs> Boom. Boom. Well, that's a, that is a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and as we just learned from Justin, protect our wealth. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.